it is um, it is done so as a going concern. So you have several levels of assets that are being all wrapped up and valued to get to your purchase price. You have the real estate, the furniture, the fixtures, the equipment, the inventory, sometimes blue sky, sometimes non-compete. And it's all wrapped up in an all-inclusive trust deed with UCC filings and or security agreements, depending upon what state the collateral is in. So a hybrid note is bundling real estate and business assets? Yes, Bill. Uh, whether it's, uh, like I say, whether it's a gas station or a convenience store or a restaurant or a tire store or, or you know, any business that is sold together with the real estate. And um, a lot of folks don't know what to do with them, but we see them as an opportunity to sort of, you know, wiggle into the front end of the note with a... Uh, with a very strong partial offer on the front end. And, of course, as the note seasons and continues to pay, we continue to buy into the note. Now, is, is this something that you bundle together, or is it brought to you this way? No, these are closed loans and, and with some seasoning on them, Bill. Um, like I say, oftentimes gas stations are sold this way. Um, there's, a, there's a real niche in the industry between about 150000 and a $1 million, where unless you're working with a... Uh, community bank, and they really understand your business model. Uh, there's not a lot of financing out there for these small mom and pop type businesses. You know, whether it's a diner or again a, a tire shop or a muffler shop or something of that nature. And um, so, therefore, you see a lot of sell or carry back paper. You also see it in uh, the western states uh, a little bit more. Uh, you see it out in the rural areas, and. Uh, doesn't mean the paper's not purchasable. It just means that you have to uh, to do it carefully. Oftentimes so we find that there's a purchase and sale agreement between the two parties prior to closing that breaks out the components of the purchase price, how much is attributable to real estate, how much to the furniture, fixtures, equipment, if it's a restaurant, the kitchen equipment, the fire suppression system, the sawing out front, cash register inside the front door, etc. The name, the website address, all of that is wrapped up as collateral. So the in, in the event that the note should fail, um, the holder of the note can step in and put an operator in and continue to operate it at its highest and best use. How often do you see these kind of notes? Well, I see them on a monthly basis. Um, back Ten or so years ago when Interbay or Bayview was uh, sucking all the air out of the room in the residential arenas, uh, bidding very low yields and very high investment-to-value advances in order to survive, Reliance sort of shifted and morphed into the mom-and-pop arenas, and uh, we've, we've become quite adept at... Um, identifying these opportunities, analyzing them, and, and actually, you know, booking them. For instance, a small 18-unit motel, you know. Uh, you want to make sure you have all the, the bedding, the website, um, any franchise agreements, etc. Uh, there's just a multitude of different properties that are, um, that are sold this way in the mom-and-pop arena. Okay. Do, uh, do these hybrid notes uh, come to you often through brokers? Yes, we see a great great deal of our business. Probably about 70 to 75% of our business is broker-driven, and the rest is just, you know, because we've been in business for so long and our website's been out there for so long, we get a lot of direct traffic now as well, and, and also some repeat business from long-standing relationships. But uh, for the most part, brokers bring us these opportunities. And do you know how they find hybrid notes, brokers? Well, I think in the ordinary process of marketing for notes, I mean, when you see a $255,000 note in, you know, Oregon, uh, you don't really know whether it's on a single-family home or on a business. And, and so when, they're, when, a, when a given broker relationship's marketing efforts brings them these one-off opportunities, um, in the course of the relationship, they know to give us a call and we'll, we'll work on them together and... Uh, sort of separate the wheat from the chafe and figure out where the uh, bricks and sticks equity protection ends and where the chattel begins. And uh, 
oftentimes uh, these note sellers have a very limited market to sell that note. And so they're more open to doing a partial purchase and uh, staying in the deal. It gives, gives us, as the investor, additional comfort that the previous owner-operator is staying in the deal with their equity position subordinate to us during the transition period. And then as we see the operator, the new operator, uh, paying timely, keeping the communication lines open, uh, paying their taxes, uh, before they become delinquent, renewing their insurance uh, timely without a fight, we then go deeper into the note and sometimes, oftentimes, fund the remainder of the note. Okay. Uh, do you expect uh, brokers to do uh, a lot of the due diligence uh, when on these hybrid notes, or do you do a lot of it? Well, you know, there's a discovery process, and every one is different. And in different states, some states are lien theory, some states are title theory. And, and so uh, as, we, as we jump state lines and get into different scenarios, um, we, I usually just huddle up with the broker, and we have that, uh, that requisite discovery phone call, and, and uh, we take a break, and I poke around on the Internet a little bit to try to source out what I can and get back on the phone with the broker and give them a step list of additional questions to ask of their note seller um, to sort of flesh out the deal so that we can see it. You know, we, we have to peel back the layers of the onion till we get good on all sides and clearly see what we're buying into. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a discovery process. There's an extra step in there beyond a simple residential transaction. But uh, again, it's a very worthwhile thing to pursue because of the limited market and uh, Reliant can get a little extra yield in these types of scenarios, and a broker can get a little larger commission. And uh, again, once it's uh, once it's here, if it's a partial that we're purchasing, uh, the broker always gets a chance to participate in subsequent commissions, even if it's several years later. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. That would be uh, called creating a. a you, you create multiple streams of income that way. How, how would that work? Well, let's say we just purchase the next 84 or 96 months of the note and the seller staying in the note with uh, the payments behind us or maybe up to a balloon. Um, you know, as the note ages and as the property appreciates and as, it's, uh, as the relationship between Reliant as the servicer and the holder of the note, and uh, as it grows with the customer and, and all of our customers, we have relationships with all of our customers, um, some of them are simple. Uh, some of them are a little more complicated. But we, uh, as we get to know their business plan and, and uh, see them growing and evolving and adding to the property and et cetera, we, you know, we'll get deeper into the note, which actually doesn't necessarily benefit the people that own the property and are operating it. Their deal is already cut and dried. What it what it actually serves to do is exit the note oh. seller from his remainderment in a later tax year. It splits their tax hit up over several years and it allows them to realize more money over time than they would have just deeply discounting it up front to get out and move on. Okay. And uh, Dave is going to be uh, teaching at our note seminar coming up in April. I, I presume uh, hybrid notes are going to be part of that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, at Reliant here we look at all types of real estate. I mean, in my portfolio, which has been aging and matriculating now for over 16 years, we've got notes on bars, restaurants, taverns, churches, gas stations, marinas, mobile home parks, veterinary clinics. I even have a pet cemetery. Um, I've got a salvage yard, a muffler shop, motorcycle shop, auto paint and body. Uh, they all at some level have, uh, environmental issues aside, they all at some level have equity protection and makes sense. And again, in these one-off opportunities, the investor gets to book a little bit more yield, and the broker oftentimes gets to collect a little larger commission. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about partials. First of all, to uh, those who may be new to that, uh, explain what you mean by a partial. A partial purchase bill is where we just uh, buy a stream of payments, not the entire note, but a stream of payments. And in exchange for that advance, we get a 100% assignment of the note and deed of trust or note and mortgage, again, depending upon what state, and all its directorial rights. Um, 
so basically what the what the note holder is doing is getting out from the front wheel from behind the wheel of the car sitting in the back seat reliant jumps in the front seat and sort of drives the drives the deal down the calendar with the servicing effort uh, when we take a loan on here at Reliant, we generate payment coupon booklets. Uh, 60 days after the transfer, we can start credit reporting at our option. Uh, additionally, we monitor uh, the taxes and insurance and make those advances to perfect the lien interest and secure the collateral in the event that either one should lapse or become delinquent. And additionally, we, um, we issue the year-end 1098 interest forms timely by January 30th. Of the so an example would be if somebody had a 10-year a um, balance, uh, ten year, uh, uh, ten years of payments left on their note. Uh, you might buy the next five years of that, and then after that, the five years are up. They get the the rest of the payment. It would either revert year. back to them, or at some point down the road, we would get a phone call asking us to to uh, to purchase the remainder of the note. Uh, Danette Ferguson here in our office that uh, works on all of the underwriting and closing and servicing, etc. Danette and I were talking today, and. Uh, I think in 16 years we've only reverted a note back at the conclusion of a partial five or six times in 16 years. So, so the, 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 the original owner for them to money, liquidate the remainder is, is very great, which means your potential for a commission is, is virtually assured. So your, your broker then gets an additional commission. With That's that. correct, Bill. Even if we have to hunt them down and maybe they're not in the, in some instances, they're not in the business anymore and we give them a call and get them up to speed and let them know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because we service all our loans in-house and the title works in place, um, credit reporting, tax and insurance monitoring, in many instances we have escrows established. That's another thing we can do as a servicer is transfer in escrows or establish escrows if customers are having trouble budgeting. So oh, okay. what we do is then get in touch with that submitting broker and bring them up to speed and tell them what we're offering. And at that juncture, they uh, tell us what to hold in the way of an additional commission for them, as long as it doesn't exceed their original commission percentage. Uh, and, it, and it happens, uh, subsequent fundings on partials happen in as little as three business days, Bill, because it's simply an addendum to the partial purchase agreement out and back and a check or wire to the customer, check or wire to the broker because everything, again, is in place. Servicing's in place. Um, title work's all intact. There are no additional expenses when we make additional advances in partial purchases because we are the end investor. Well, I would imagine that's a, a pleasant phone call for a lot of people to receive. Do you remember that partial you sold to Reliant, uh, you brokered to Reliant? A uh, number of years ago, well, vaguely. Well, we got some money for you. We're sending. You, we bought well, the rest and of and when we get to Vegas in April, Bill, we can ask that of Jeff Armstrong. Jeff Armstrong last month got a commission check on a partial that just out of the blue, the the seller called us and wanted to uh, to turn it into a uh, you know whole loan on Reliance Books and and exit it. Oh. Um, oh. Again, sometimes partials are a result of the note seller being discount sensitive. In other words, I've had individuals contact me directly and in, in, in the instances where I've had a chance to speak directly with note sellers, what I've come to find out is that they don't want to be bothered with servicing the note and chasing the payments, monitoring taxes and insurance, etc. Uh, they don't really need the money, but it's really aggravating to have to monitor this note in their you know, passive years. So what we do is we'll just buy the payments up to but not including the balloon for, say, 90% of that present value, and we'll take on the servicing here and, and clip that little coupon. Uh, again, you know, professionally servicing the node and, and uh, duly noticing the uh, remainder or the duly noticing the payors that their balloon is coming up. And what it does is it removes that what are we going to do phone call that most of the individuals that hold notes get when a balloon comes. Now we're just a, a big corporation that's credit reporting and servicing their loan, and we don't have an emotional interest in this. We're not going to blink. It's our fiduciary responsibility to service the loan in accordance with its terms. When a, when a loan is sold or assigned, nothing changes for the payor except where they make their payments. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, uh, again, that's 
when sometimes folks are discount sensitive, so we'll do a conservative partial, and then every three or four years they'll say, you know, how about another 40000 out of that note, or how about I sell you another, you know, 80 payments, or what would you pay me for that in, this, in these markets? And uh, it's, again, it's good cookies. It's uh, picking low-hanging fruit, I'd like to say. We, uh, if you have any questions for Dave Krunick, uh, please email them to me, and I will ask him. Uh, the email address is wjm, as in Michael, wjm at papersourceonline.com. wjm at papersourceonline.com. We'll be happy to take your questions for Dave Krunick with Reliant Financial, which is reliantfinancial.com is his company website address. Uh, Dave is going to be with us at the April Notes Symposium event, April 26 and 27 in Las Vegas. And I'd like to encourage you to go to papersourceseminars.com and uh, check us out and uh, see what's going on there at papersourceseminars.com. That's going to be an interesting event. I, I, I told you, Dave, that we have over 100 people so far, and uh, we're just getting started. So it'll be, uh, that's, that's really fantastic to hear, Bill, because you know, you're sort of a, the, a beacon in the wilderness here with the uh, seller finance industry. You're, you're sort of the, the last one standing and, and um, uh, carrying the torch here for the discount industry, and that's why we're so eager to support your, your every effort in that direction. And uh, for those of you listening in, if you get a chance to get out to Vegas, you'll find it a very motivating, uplifting um, weekend and you'll come back real charged up and full of new ideas and techniques and tactics and marketing strategies and uh, negotiating uh, skills. You'll, you'll network with inve other investors that are there. And, um, but not only that, you'll, your own kind, it's a whole room full of brokers. And, um, you know, when you chat amongst yourselves and forge friendships and um, it, it's, it's a very worthwhile experience. Well, good. I, I will point out there, there are a number of private investors coming as well, but any private investor that I've ever met, and me being one of them, uh, you get all sorts of paper that you say, you know, it just doesn't, you know, I don't want to buy a note on a house in or Oregon when I live in Texas, so I'm going to give it to, to Dave Krunick, for example. Um, so even even in, uh, investors get a whole lot of paper that they, uh, for one reason or another, are not in a position to buy. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's going to be an interesting group. I think what we're going to do too is uh, I've seen so many uh, names come through that have signed up that I know this person and I know they've been in the business as private investors or or you know um, whatever their situation might be. Sure. Uh, and we're going to be talking to them as well and uh, letting people know, hey. Person sitting next to you might have, you know, ten or twenty or a hundred times the experience you do, and you don't even know it. Well, we're going to bring that out and let you know who's sitting next to you and who's in the room. Uh, so it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, that's papersourceseminars.com. Uh, again, if you have any questions for Dave Krunick, please uh, email wjm at papersourceonline.com. One question that came in is. Uh, uh, what is your best advice uh, for brokers in, in how to get better quotes for note investors from note investors? That's a good question. That is a very good question, Bill. And uh, my response would be to sort of steal a line from Bob Repass. That's a name from the past. Bob used to run Interbay, and Bob used to always challenge his submitting brokers to quote take ownership of the opportunity. In other words, in your initial telephone interview, which may last just 15 or 20 scant minutes, you have to gather facts, build rapport, you know, seek the truth in the transaction, and determine you know, just how you can be of assistance to that customer. But you should know enough about that opportunity at, at the end of that 15 or 20 minutes that uh, if you had to put your retirement money or your parents' retirement money in the opportunity, subject to confirmation of value, estoppel cooperation with the payor, and clear title, you should know enough about the deal that you could make an offer on it. And uh, that's what we call taking ownership of the situation. So pretend you're buying the note. What would you want to know? You'd want to know about the payor and where in the curve of life they are and if it's a two-income household and 
you know, you'd want to know if there's any children or extended family nearby or if they're from the area originally or if they transferred in from out of state. You know, you're looking for stability and you're looking for ability to repay. So a lot of times what I find brokers don't do enough of is they don't go down the rabbit hole on the, the payors and where they are in the curve of life. Are they in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s? You know, what does he do outside the home? What does she do outside the home? You know, and it's nice to hear that maybe she works for the hospital or, or he's a dentist or, you know, it's nice to hear some health benefits in there somewhere coming through the front door. I mean, even if a, even if a gentleman is 18 years a janitor in the Philadelphia school district, you know, he's, uh, you know, that leopard's not going to change his spots. You know, his credit score is established. His, he's ascribed his status. He's probably got, you know, a 20-year pension coming down the road. He's got health benefits coming through the door. So, again, um, ability to repay makes all the difference in the world, as well as understanding chain of sales price. Now, I use these two terms quite often when I speak to the submitting brokers because two or three years ago, times got really tough in this business. And we were struggling with our bank lines who were getting a little bit nervous. And so we assured them that on any new deal that we book, we were really going to go down the rabbit hole and we really were going to flush out the chain of sales price and take some extra time as to where in the curve of life our payors are and their ability to repay. And it's made a world of difference in how we book our paper and um, you know the, uh, the success rate of our portfolio. We have very few delinquencies. Of course, we always keep equity as the principal source of repayment. So if you things start getting difficult, we make a play for the deed, and people either fall in line or, or we offer them cash for keys. So it's, you know, it, it, in the end, this is a people business, and, and brokers should really realize that the true customer in the note sale process is the investor, the purchaser, the consumer, as defined by Webster's. And those are the relationships they need to work on and they need to nurture and they need to sell into. They should always be underwriting to protect that invested dollar, always asking those difficult questions because there's only two reasons people sell a note, Bill. They either need money for an emergency, maybe a medical emergency or a financial emergency in their life, uh, or for an opportunity, another, another better opportunity. That's one reason they need the money. The second reason is they want to get rid of a problem. So it's, it's up to the broker through the discovery process to figure out why the note seller is disturbing that recurring income stream and what they're trying to accomplish. Oftentimes they just need 25000 They don't need to sell a $90,000 loan for $75,000. They just need 25000 So maybe they only need to sell 48 or 54 payments to accomplish that objective. Well, and you know, that's up- exactly right. And Pete Fortunato has often uh, made that point. that You know, this is not about money. It's about people. And it's about getting to know people and finding out what their situation is and trying to structure an offer that will meet their needs. And, for example, you know, you and I have done uh, deals where uh, somebody, as you say, they don't need ninety thousand right. dollars. They just need. I remember one particular that s- sticks in my mind: an, an elderly lady. Uh, I was talking to her about. And I don't remember the numbers now, but it was a, a large note, uh, a couple hundred thousand, as I recall. A very nice horse property in in uh, uh, upstate New York, and right. first mortgage and all this. I mean, it's a golden note, um, and she'd gotten you know these these. Quotes for a hundred and this and a hundred and that for the next twenty, you know, the twenty-five year note or whatever. It was. And all come to find out, she was what do they call it? Land poor. All she all she needed was some money to pay some property taxes. Right. You know, all she needed was like six, eight thousand dollars or fifteen thousand, whatever the number was. You know, and it, you know, and and in instances like that, Bill, if the monthly payment is twelve hundred or more. Yeah we can even do what's called a, a fractional purchase where we only buy, 
let's say that person needs some of that monthly payment for income but also needs to raise $20,000 to pay some back taxes or some estate taxes or clear up some credit or have a car repaired or replace a car. We could buy $600, $700, $800 of the monthly payment or we could pass through six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars of the month. That's payment. exactly what I. That's exactly what we did with her. You know, her monthly payment was whatever. You know, and I said, well, how about this? We'll give you this chunk of money so you can pay your taxes, and we'll and we'll take this amount every month, and you get the rest every month. Correct. So you you, you get that payment, and I'll tell you what. Let's throw in another five thousand dollars. How about you you taking a cruise? And she loved that idea. Right. <laughs> So those are the, that's what makes this business so fascinating. Well, I think the most successful people in this business strive to get the individual on the other end of the phone that's calling in with a need and a problem to be solved. They strive to be perceived as that individual calling in would perceive their tax preparer or their insurance agent. You know, let's face it, when you meet with your tax preparer and you sit down and they have all your information, they tell you right where the rubber leaves the road and what you owe and what you can do. Here's your options. And and basically, if, if you have a longstanding relationship with that tax preparer, you pretty much don't question it. You know, they're the pro. Uh, these are my options. Okay, I understand. This is what we'll do then. And then you make a, an educated decision. Uh, same thing with an insurance agent who reviews your insurance packages. You know whether you're you've got kids that start driving or you need more life insurance because you're getting in a critical curve in life. Um, but you, that that agent, that specialist will will make recommendations to you, and then you will make the final decision. And uh, the same thing goes for the note business. What we strive to do is be a good listener, ask questions that force that note seller to admit both the strengths and the weaknesses of the note. Why do we do that? Well, that roundaboutly reduces their expectations a little bit, and it also separates you from the other people they're talking to that just aren't really you know, seeking the truth and the, the opportunity in the transaction. And uh, if you approach this business as a problem solver when that phone rings and you just work on... Uh, you know, solving their problem and, and trying to address their needs and getting them to admit what they're trying to accomplish, the process, your, 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 your hit rate, your, your success rate goes up exponentially. Instead of just swinging at a pinata, making full offers all the time, what I always ask my brokers is, you know, if they, are they open to a partial? Why are they selling the note? You know, let's untie our hands here. Let us, let us try to tailor an offer because you have options Options with an S on the end. You have options with this note beyond just a full offer. And exactly. uh, a lot of people initially have a knee-jerk reaction to partials because they don't understand the mechanics of them. And it's really not rocket science, and that's something we'll delve into at the convention a little bit more. But uh, it's a wonderful vehicle. It really is. And not only that, but, you know, it's also from a – and I'm not giving tax advice here, but partials – also help to kind of push that uh, the uh, maybe the potential upside equity in a property if it hasn't been depreciated too much because there is recapture there, but push the tax exposure out and spread it out over several years as well by taking periodic disbursements in a note until it's finally liquidated in its entirety. Well, for those who uh, might have joined us late, Dave, Dave referred to uh, our event uh, April 26 and 27. You can find out more about that at papersourceseminars.com. Also, wanted to mention that the uh, we have several uh, of our teleseminars posted at papersourceseminars.com, so you can actually go there and listen to some other uh, teleseminars that we have done uh, in the past few months uh, by other people who are going to be teaching uh, at our event in April. And there are no sales pitches. If there's a motto of this event, it is no sales pitches. In fact, that's probably the motto, I would say, of every event that Paper Source uh, has ever put on. We do not believe in it, that you should spend a lot of money uh, to get an airplane ticket or drive or whatever. In these days, driving is <laughs> less expensive than an airplane ticket. And uh, you know, spend money in a hotel and food and whatever, uh, and go in and get the registration fee, and then sit there and be subjected to a bunch of sales pitches. Which I'm afraid is uh, uh, more, you know, just just all too common. Uh, so our 
purpose here is uh, our our motto is no sales pitches. You won't sit there and listen to sales pitches. You know, we we try to teach, and we get the best teachers we can. So I won't belabor that because that's a sales pitch in itself. So I'm <laughs> yeah, well, I'm and, and actually, what you're also going to see at at this event is is you're going to see that all of the investors and funding sources and maybe a full third of the registry of node of investors will be in attendance. We all know each other on site. We all talk to each other over the years or, or through the year. Uh, we check in with each other and see how things are going and what are you doing and what are you seeing and, and um, what's trending in your, your neck of the woods. Uh, I've got Scott and Eric up in Boise and you know Danny Gilman up in New York. and you know There's people all over the country, and sometimes I might get a deal in their backyard, and I, I might call up there and say, hey, you know, keep me out of the ditches on this one. If yeah. you run by and yeah. take a look, I can't get a street scene shot through Google Maps. Uh, so we all, there's a camaraderie, and um, you, you'll see it, and you'll want to be a part of it. And it's, uh, Oh, yeah. It's a tremendous opportunity to get to know people. As you say, Danny will be there. Yeah. Uh, Scott will be there. Fred Foote will be there uh, from Michigan. How about Tom Henderson? He always makes me laugh. Yeah, absolutely. Tom uh, told me he'd probably be there as well. Fantastic. I always look forward to visiting with Tom at these annual conventions. And Eric Swanson will be there, and uh, we're just getting a whole bunch of folks that have uh, been around for a number of years, and, and it's uh, it's a great opportunity to network. And for people new to the industry, you will make invaluable contacts. We have some questions coming in. Uh, again, WJM, as in Michael, at papersourceonline.com, or I should say as in Mencaro. But, uh, if you have any questions for Dave Koenig, Question uh, came in, a uh, very uh, straightforward question from Sonia. How can I get started with the note business as a broker in Chicago? And she's in a kind of a difficult area uh, geographically. Well, yes, she is. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not much on the marketing aspect of sourcing up notes. That, that falls more into someone like Jeff Armstrong's basket of expertise. But um, basically, it, it's... Uh, your success will will be a, a grassroots campaign, probably with uh, realtors and uh, local developers, uh, courthouse research, running ads and driveway circulars, etc. Um, I've often found that uh, going to rotary functions and befriending insurance agents, they have a whole drawer full of lost payee notices to other than banks. And um, explain you know, that a little. Bit. That's Explain also a that. source. Explain what you mean a little bit, please. Well, for instance, when you uh, your typical home will have a hazard policy from Allstate or State Farm or Farmers or Foremost or someone like that, and uh, uh, whenever there's a lien, there is a lost payee clause or an additional insured clause, which means if there's a mortgage on the property that the insurance proceeds from any claim would be a joint or a two-party check to both the owner of the property and the first lien holder. Right. So, um, again, so that's, how you discover the first, that's how you discover who the first lien holder is? is that well, I mean, that you know, again, uh, partnering up with an insurance agent that uh, uh, he might know, you know, he would he would have clients in his drawer that have mortgages that, uh, that um you know, okay. the lost payee clause is reflected as an, an individual instead of an institution, a bank, or a finance company, or a, or a credit union. I might, I might add to Sonia and all those others who have that question, how do, how do we get started, or if we're already in the business, how do we improve our business? At, at, I'm going to give you a website. Uh, there are a lot of videos, particularly on marketing, and marketing meaning how, exactly how you get started or how, how do you improve your business, how do you find notes. I mean, that's the big problem. You know, there are investors, but finding those notes and finding the marketable notes, the good quality notes, is really the challenge. So uh, if you go, I'll give you this website. If you go to papersourceuniversity.com, you'll find an opportunity. There are several levels. One of them is free, and they're very reasonably priced levels to, to find all of this information on uh, on more marketing, improving your note business. Um, next question we have again at wjm at papersourceonline.com. We can't take too many more questions because we're going to be wrapping it up here. Uh, but if you have a question for uh, Dave Krunick, 
do that, please. His website, by the way, is Reliant Financial, R E L I A N T Financial dot com. Question, technical question for you. On a partial, if the taxes are delinquent, do you require the taxes to be paid by the seller uh, before slash purchaser beforehand, or will you add that to the loan and extend the partial? And then I guess a secondary question, do you require an escrow agreement? Well, if we're buying a loan that has taxes owing, that's really not a performing loan. It's either subperforming or non-performing. I mean, it, technically the loan's in default and can be accelerated. So when you, when you take on the servicing of a partial with a remaindermint holder behind you, you have to service the loan in accordance with usual and customary servicing standards, meaning um, if the loan's delinquent, you have to notice them, give them 30 days to reinstate, etc. Now what we do here at Reliant is if the account does not have escrows, Whenever they stumble like that, uh, we immediately pay the delinquent taxes to perfect the lien interest and keep the loan performing. And then we set the customer out on a repayment plan where we might add $200 to their monthly payment for the next 10 months to, to catch them up. Um, same thing with insurance lapsing. We have the ability here to force place a hazard policy on a property uh, quickly with a phone call. We have a blanket policy that covers all the loans under our stewardship, and should an individual loan level policy lapse, we can then force place it and then contact them with the premium that we uh, had to pay to get the insurance in place and then set them out on a repayment plan or set them on escrows to alleviate that problem going forward. Do you require an escrow agreement? I, we don't always require them. Again, nothing changes for the payor except where they make their payments. So if the note doesn't require escrows to begin with, um, of course, when we introduce ourselves with the payment redirection notice and the estoppel, et cetera, uh, at the underwriting, at point of underwriting, we avail them of an opportunity to establish escrows if they so choose at that time or at any time going forward in the note. Uh, okay. They're not mandated to, but it's an option and it makes it easier for us, and it, um, you know, it makes it easier for the payor to budget. All right. Well, uh, we have a number of other questions, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I will uh, send them to you, Dave, and you can, you can answer them uh, individually if you, Be happy if you to. wish. Thank you. Uh, we're going to do finish with, uh, I just want to ask you, what are, are some of the things you're going to be talking about uh, in April at our, at our note event? Well, again, I'm really going to stress this concept of partial purchases and how integral a tool they are in this, this, the, uh, in this economy and environment. Um, you know, for instance, here at Reliant, um, when, it, when a loan is technically underwater, uh, when a property has a larger loan balance on it than its current market value, um, it makes it very hard to to purchase the whole loan. But again, in those instances, we will still purchase a partial on that type of property. Uh, for instance, say a, lo say a little three-bedroom, two-bath block pool home in Melbourne, Florida, just four or five blocks from the beach, sold for 225000 back in 2007. Uh, Might have sold for 25000 down in a 200 first on a 30-year AM. And now the property is only worth 135, 145, but the loan balance is still 190. Well, we'll we'll get in there and and purchase a partial, you know, on up into 60, 65 percent of the current market value. So if it's worth 140, we'll get in there for you know, 74,000, 75,000, 80,000 advance. Uh, when you look at the situation again, and you look at the curve of life of the payors, you've got a you got a family in there with kids in school, and um, it's a $900 payment. They live five blocks on the beach. It's a pool home. I mean, you know, granted, where, where else are they going to live and raise their family in that type of environment for $900 a month? So sometimes it's not about, you know, purchasing that whole loan or um, – worrying about whether or not something's underwater. When we get a chance to interview them, we, exp you know, we, we tell them that nothing changes for them, and, and obviously uh, the next rising tide will lift all boats, and 
there'll be some appreciation down the road and some some principal reduction and things will fall in line if they're they're happy where they're at. Well, we're going to uh, take a moment to wrap this up, but again, uh, thank you, Dave Krunick, Reliant Financial, R E L I A N T Financial dot com, uh, and uh, Dave will be at our event in April at the uh, Paper Source uh, uh, Symposium, and you can go to PaperSourceSeminars dot com if you. See. Dave Krunick, I want to thank you again, and uh, looking forward to seeing you in a couple of months. Absolutely, Bill. Thank you again for the opportunity. And to all you all listening, uh, I can assure you, if you can you find the ways and means to get out to Vegas for that, that long three-day weekend, um, actually it will be short because it will fly by. It's very, very invigorating and stimulating, and you'll meet a lot of neat people, and you'll realize that you're, you're not alone in this business in your home office, uh, that there's a, there's a whole community of brokers out there. Um, living and dying in three-quarter time with their, their business plans, too. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's just a fantastic experience, and I hope you all take a leap of faith and give it a go. Thanks, Dave. Take care. Thank Good you, night. Bill. Good night. Good night, all. Bye-bye.